Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for this morning. It's uh, delightful. We thank you for the rain. We uh, are reminded that uh, all these things come to us from you, our Father in heaven. And so they're good for us. We cherish the morning. We thank you for the opportunity to be here together and we thank you now for the opportunity to look at your word and draw from it these wonderful truths. And so for all of us, not just deacons, but for all of us to go out and be more like our Savior. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10 I preached at uh, Redeemer OPC in Matthews several years ago. And uh, it was my first time to preach there. And I know Nathan had this experience. Uh, but uh, that first time I preached there, I, uh, I look, let's see, look down and right over here with this lovely lovely lady sat George Knight he and Miss Virginia were sitting there and I'm going to tell you it's it's a bit even if you know Dr. Knight and know that he's kind and gentle uh it's a it's a bit uh what's the word uh, intimidating to be you know preaching a new test particularly a new testament passage of scripture with with him sitting there. And, uh, you know, I knew him through the seminary and all. and But still, I, you know, I had sat on the, on the podium with him at graduations with our regalia on. And still, it's, it's George Knight III. And uh, so I finish. And I step down and somebody's speaking to me. And Dr. Knight, Miss Virginia, came over and he put his arm around me. Now, I don't know about you, but anytime somebody walks up and they just put their arm around you, you kind of expect the worst. You know, like, you know, let me tell you, boy. You know, I, that's, so I thought, oh, goodness. And he says, that was very fine exposition. I was very convicted. I don't think I've ever preached on that passage. And I don't think I've ever heard a sermon preached on the doctrine of the communion of saints. I was very convicted. This passage decided in our confession as, as, a, as a passage concerning the communion of saints. Uh, I didn't make that up. I didn't, I, just, I didn't just figure out, hey, I think I'll preach a sermon on communion of saints. Let's go find a passage. Uh, but I want to read it to you, and particularly verse 24 is good for us this morning. But I'm going to start in verse 18. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us, and we have this series of let us here, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You notice the exhortations that take something of a force of, of an imperative, a command there, the let us statements. Um, 
but notice it's let us. How often in the New Testament, the plurals. Uh, we live, you know, the temptation is, I have to be careful not to slip into preaching mode here, but the temptation all around us in our communities is individual. I mean, our nation, let's just face it, our nation was founded on a rugged individualism. The whole, the whole at the heart of manifest destiny uh, leading out of, is, is that me bumping? Am I? Tighten it to the back. The harness is loose. Is that what you're saying? That's what I thought too, but I don't know what to do about it. It's probably bothering me more than you, but okay. <laughs> okay. That's a new feeling I don't think I've ever had before. Uh, reminds me of a Miss Marple line from Agatha Christie. Oh, I just remembered something I forgot I ever knew. Uh, a new feeling. So, we're, we're, so, we're so conditioned and informed toward an individualistic life. And the Bible is so corporate. The Bible is so, is so plural. We're, we're so singular and the Bible is mostly plural. And how often Paul calls us to us, y'all, you know, William Hendrickson, uh, I think it was Matt yesterday, quoted, uh, hey, you should be happy. Most of his time at seminary, I called him Jonathan, his brother, because Jonathan had been there immediately before he was. So I'm, I'm better. I'm, I, I haven't said Jonathan once yet. Uh, and, but, uh, but Hendrickson, he quoted yesterday, Hendrickson does that, that funny thing with the, the spacing of the Y-O-U, when it's plural, you, the second person, plural, uh, all the way through his commentaries to, to let us know, because in English, we don't do a very good job with plurals. You know, we just talk about you. Well, we don't know if that's you, you, or you, y'all. And so, if we just translate the Greek, Paul does a good job of saying y'all. All the, I mean, he even says, all y'all sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, here, let us, let us, let us. It's obviously talking to the church. Uh, the Beatitudes. We often refer to the Beatitudes. Those covenant blessings are in the plural. And then it goes on to, you are to be salt and light. And the you there is the church. It's plural. Uh, it's easy for us to think very much me, me, me. And, 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 and you, you, you instead of us. And so um, Paul, uh, I think, wrote Hebrews. And here, whoever wrote it, God ultimately being the author, calls us to draw near with a sincere heart hold fast the confession of faith, and then finally consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. I'd submit to you, that's not just, we can argue from the, from the general to the specific here. That's for all Christians. We're all supposed to be considering how to stimulate one another. But if that's true of every individual in the church, how much more so of the deacons? So that they can then help the whole body do this thing. And it not just be a one-on-one -on -one or a one-for-one -one thing, but it can be a one-for-all thing and an all-for-one. And so that's a wonderful passage, I think, for the communion of saints, but also for the deacons uh, this morning. We saw yesterday it's a spiritual office. It's distinct from that of the eldership, even though both are spiritual, mature men. 
Uh, the elders are overseers of all things spiritual. The deacons are spiritually mature men who administer the temporal affairs of the church. And as our brother Mike reminded us, and I'll bring this up this morning, uh, uh, for instance, uh, as we think about taking care of physical things, that's ultimately, and this has to stay in our, in our minds, and it should stay closer to the front than the back, it's ultimately so that things are right and good for worship on Sunday and Sunday morning, Sunday night, and for those, those, those occasions of, of fellowship. That's part of the communion of the saints. That's part of stirring up or stimulating, as the New American Standard translates it. Uh, so keep that in mind. A few basics here to start with. Uh, Christ is our prophet. And he's given the church her instructions. We need to, let's not ever forget who's the source of the instruction we have. The teaching that we have. The faith, that body of doctrine that we have. It's Christ, our prophet. And because he has said these things, and because he's our king, remember? Remember? He's subduing us. He's conquering us. To do what? Well, to ruin us, of course. No. He subdues us so that we do all that he's commanded us. Those words of Christ in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's easy to say, oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. He's done so much for me. He's done everything for me. I'll see you all next week. Or what James warns against. Oh, boy, that's really rough. Yeah, sounds like you've had a rough week, a rough month, a rough year. Uh, uh. Is there any, you know, can I drop you off someplace? I'll pray for you. Instead of, you know, what can I do? What can we do? It's easy for us to say we love. John really gets hard. You know, John picks up that, that singular verse of Je uh, Jesus' words. If you, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he writes the first epistle. Right? I mean, think about it. Because the whole book is about loving and doing. And then chapter 4, verse 20, if you say you love God but you hate the brothers, Calvin, Calvin's comments on that are remarkable. He says, how could you say that you love God when you hate his very image. In other words, it's not possible. You can't love that which projects the image and not love the image too. So, we're to be about loving and doing, and we can because Christ is our king and he's subduing us. Gerardo said uh, not to forget that uh, we're to do everything because of Scripture, because God said it. And he says, without a warrant from his word, either explicitly given in it or derived from it by good and necessary consequence, no element can lawfully exist, no office can be established, no measure be adopted within the whole extension of the ecclesiastical sphere, that a good and necessary consequence a logical and therefore legitimate inference from facts, statements, principles, and the divine word is with us, formally acknowledged to be of equal authority with the word itself, and then, and when declared to the church, bind her conscience and enforce her practice. Now, the reason I read that is because we sometimes become very fundamentalistic. I remember Daryl Hart. During the time Nathan and I would have been at Westminster, Daryl was there, the librarian, librarian, also taught some of the history. And uh, 
And I remember him one day saying, you know, and he, he's OP, so he could say this, okay? Uh, this is not a PCA guy saying it about y'all, because I could say this about PCA too. But Daryl one day said, you know, the OPC has a big, broad stripe of fundamentalism right down at her back. And sometimes that's all that shows up. Now, his point in saying that is sometimes we become very, you know, give me the verse. Well, there's not a verse. But there's the totality of biblical teaching. There's the good and necessary consequence, the inferences that can be drawn. For instance, first thing most of us run and think of is the Trinity. There's not a verse that says, I, I, God, am one in three. But it's all over the Bible. Just reading through Judges. Oh, and by the way, yesterday morning, Old Testament reading, 1 Samuel. Remember the Benjamites coming down to Shiloh? I was driving here and I stopped and I was reading my Old Testament reading. And there was that verse. And I thought, hey, I'm heading to Shiloh. Does that make me a Benjamite? I hope not. But, uh, you know, you, you, that good and necessary inference and that studying your scripture, again, back to the wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit to know the scripture and to be able to apply it. Not just when it's crystal clear, explicitly stated, but working out the application of it, particularly when we get into tough situations. That's important. Now, here's what I want to do. With those basics, that the scriptures our source, Christ our prophet, Christ our king, knowing that we have the priest, we, we have the communion of saints at our uh, as our concern, our object of concern. And, uh, and so what are we supposed to be doing? I want to argue that we have basically four big duties, four big arenas where we're to work. I want to turn back to Acts chapter 6 and read that real quickly. You know it. Listen now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. I'm going to stop reading right there. So the apostles, and who are the successors? The ordinary office successor of the apostles uh, becomes the deacons here in what they're supposed to be doing, and then the elders at that other level. So... The ministry of word and prayer continues to be carried out, fleshed out by the elders, the pastors. This work that's immediately before us here is carried out by this new office, this office of deacon, the servants. Now, When you consider all that is entailed in that, I think it's summarized in these four duties that I've set out for you there. You see them. The duty is a fiscal agent. The duty is property management, mercy ministry, and then delegation. And it may be that delegation is the number one. Since I mentioned yesterday in verse 3, it's... Uh, uh, we read, or yes, verse 3, 
choose these seven men, good reputation, full of spirit, wisdom, whom we may put in charge of. Not seven men who will go and do this, but seven men who we will put in charge of the task. So the first thing, let's talk about fiscal agent. I'm going to I've got a bunch of good stuff here, and I want to be sure and get it all done. So pardon me if I, if I, if I just kind of get into, into, into read mode. I, I, promised, I promised to read with inflection and try to keep you, keep you hooked this morning. But I, I just want to cover. First of all, I want you to know that this idea that, that the deacons are responsible for the fiscal matters of the church is not new. It's not my idea uh it goes back to these passages but our forefathers for instance the first book of discipline of the church of scotland that's you know we we trace our lineage back there and it says this the office of deacon is to gather and distribute the alms of the poor according to the direction of session that's the first book of discipline, 1560. That's that initial book of church order uh, of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. Again, it says the deacons should take up the whole rent of the kirk, disposing them to the ministry, the schools, the poor, and their bounds, according to the appointment of the kirk, the church. The second book of discipline that comes along about mm, 18 years later, Andrew Melville Melville's really the guy that, that, that fleshes out the Presbyterianism, and basically that's where we are today is Melville's understanding and teaching of the Scripture concerning Presbyterian church polity and governance and the way we function. Second book says there, the deacon's office and power is to receive and distribute the whole ecclesiastical goods unto them to whom they are appointed. He and again, the second book says the goods ecclesiastical or the things of the church, the money of the church, uh, the offerings of the church ought to be collected and distributed by the deacons as the word of God appoints. He saw this as, as the word of God teaches this. We believe that, I hope. Uh, that they who bear the office in the kirk be provided for without care or solicitude. Uh, Samuel Miller here on the American scene. They might, with great propriety, be made the managers of all the money tables or physical matters of each congregation. And for this purpose, might be incorporated, if it thought necessary by law, that they might be enabled regularly to hold and employ all the property, real and personal, of the church. They, he's speaking of, are the deacons. He goes on to say, all of... Uh, uh, all of this, uh, the function to which the deacon was appointed by the apostles was to manage the pecuniary affairs of the church and especially to preside over the collections and disbursements for the poor. Thomas Smythe, Charleston, South Carolina, Second Presbyterian Church, another prominent ecclesiastical writer, minister, scholar of the 19th century says deacons were appointed for the purpose of managing the temporal affairs of the church and especially to attend to the needs of the poor by inspecting their situation and supplying their wants all the reformed churches agree in believing that the scriptures clearly point out deacons as distinct officers in the church whose business is, is to take care of the poor to distribute among them the collection which may be raised for their use and generally to manage the temporal affairs of the church. So, from our Scottish fathers to our, our, uh, uh, our American fathers, uh, there's, there's agreement that the deacons have control of under the super oversight of the elders of the fiscal matters, the money matters of the church. Guys, I want to tell you what. I mentioned this yesterday the tensions that come up between elders and deacons, sessions and diaconates. Um, James Henley Thornwell said that those kind of things arise because we confuse the keys and the purse. 
the keys of the kingdom, the authority to bind, residing in the eldership, the purse being strapped to the shoulders of the diaconate. And what Thorne will say there is when we confuse those, when we put the purse on the elder's shoulder, because that's the way it usually works. We don't usually, we don't usually find the, the keys of the kingdom in the hands of the deacons. But we do see the elders slipping their arm through the purse strap from time to time. Purely motivated, but nevertheless confusing their works. Now what happens there is that then it cuts into, well let me illustrate this. I was, I was really proud about two years ago, we had an issue. One of the elders came into session meeting and uh, so uh, we had the docket, you know, all set. And he said, I need, I need to ask a favor to put an additional item on the docket. I know it's late, I'm sorry. And as he said what it was, he stopped about three words short of finishing his sentence and he said, oh, that's diaconal. Never mind, I'll give it to our deacons. Now that was a win day. That was a beautiful day. That was a glorious day because Many sessions sit around doing diaconal work. And they may sit around and... How many elders again? Yeah. How many times have you sat around and debated and discussed it before you finally said, you know, we need to just pass this to the deacons? How many minutes, how many hours in a year are lost? Now, there are some things you, you need to discuss in order to say, you know what we're for this and the deacons are going to want to know that we're for this before they get it in their hands and so we need to do this we need to let them know our mind on this before they get it I understand that and that's right and proper but too often we find ourselves just gravitating to those and I'm gonna tell you if you had your choice as an elder between talking about marital infidelity and what are we going to do and talking about whether or not the diaconate should spend more money on a on a better lawnmower i'd much rather talk about the merits of a honda driven you know husqvarna than what to do with john and jane who've gone stupid over here right i mean i think that's how it that's sometimes how it happens is, you know, I just don't, I'm just not up to Jane and John tonight. Let's do a little deacon work. Now, that's not to say all deacon work is easier, but if it's that matter of buying a lawnmower or not, it is. That's a whole lot more. In fact, I'll just, I'll go. I'll go do it. I love doing that. I've often said, you know, if I weren't preaching, if I weren't teaching, Home Depot would be where I'd want to work. I would just have a lot of fun. I'd probably spend everything I make on tools. But anyway, um, you get the point. We're to be involved. Listen, we're to be people who not only collect, and that means we have to stir up. We have to, we have to stir up the pot. We have, to, we have to encourage people. But we're also to be givers. Uh, There are a lot of churches proud of how much they have. And they do a really good job of, of, of investing. Now, n this may not apply to any of your churches, but there are churches out there who have money. And they don't use it. And they're, 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 they're saving it for that proverbial uh, what was it, uh, the $25,000 emergency fund Mike referenced yesterday, and they got this need, 
and it'd be five thousand dollars but this is for this over here well you know this is now that um, and so they keep waiting for that proverbial rainy day listen listen to what Romans 12 6 and 7 uh, talks about uh, giving and liberality and showing mercy um, and this is what uh, Thomas Smythe says concerning that. The deaconship is immediately connected with giving and showing mercy. Now, while Romans 12 is not, again, specifically about the diaconate, it's about the church in general, Christians in general, the communion of saints in general. But again, Smythe draws the line and says, but we're responsible for the overall picture of the stewardship of the church and so when when it speaks to the church in general about giving and showing mercy it's speaking to us specifically Calvin says by the givers of whom he speaks here he did not understand those who gave of their property but the deacons who presided in dispensing the public charities of the church. Uh, we, we need our deacons to be generous, to be givers. Wise in discerning. We've already established that. That's part of the nature of the beast. But out of that wisdom has to flow a loving, merciful, giving spirit, and a giving heart. From Acts passage, we see explicit biblical warrant for the diaconate collecting and distributing the finances of the church. From the Romans passage, we would add passages like 1 Peter 4, 10, and 11. Uh, deacons are to be good stewards, handling those gifts of the church with discernment of judgment, a winsome cheerfulness, and spiritual sensitivity. Now, let me talk about some responsibilities that flow out of our fiscal overarching physical responsibility and the first is the collecting of the of the necessary funds for various uses of the church the physical agent of the church is developing the grace of liberality in the membership the deacons i would argue are the primary promoters of generosity second corinthians 9 5 we're to, we're to give generously lavishly and we're to give also cheerfully that passage tells us and so we need to be as deacons and I would say as elders and ministers in general but deacons specifically we're supposed to be in inculcating that that spirit that attitude of generosity and of cheerfulness we should love we just had one of our missionaries drop us a note and uh, he needed a couple of things one was uh, this is in Honduras it's a wonderful work it's a new work and uh, so he just sent his supporting churches around uh, the area we support them they're brand new to us but uh, I've known this young guy for a few years now and two things he wanted to encourage churches let them know about one was the need for a computer for a, a local national who was helping him with literature to, to promote publication and stuff newsletters what have you and his computer is 12 years old. I don't know if any of you have a 12 year old computer or not. Most of us, I, I would say, we, we may, but if we do, they're out in the garage or in the basement. We just don't know what to do with it. We don't use it anymore. It's too sluggish. And, uh, and they're inexpensive now. So that was forwarded to our deacons. 
because it's an extra item. It's not in our budget. So we forwarded it to the deacons and said, you know, we're in on this. Do what you, do what you can. Second item was, he's, they're starting there a, uh, a, a reading room. Christian literature in Spanish. Not many reformed things ever have passed around Honduras. And so, go, I noticed as I was leaving, bulletin was being prepped, and uh, there's a new announcement from our diaconate encouraging the folks. Recently, Pastor Aaron Halbert was here. He mentioned the new reading room that they're wanting to start there and uh, to, to Gusagapa and and so they're, they're wanting to, to, to procure the books to start stocking this reading room so people can walk in, they can, they can meet people off the street that they wouldn't otherwise have a way of meeting. Christian science have those things. Uh, Roman Catholics have those things. Uh, and, and they have people filtering in and out all the time. It's a great opportunity. And so they're going to do this. And so there's the announcement from our deacons. Uh, the deacons have pledged already out of the deacon fund this amount, and we, we're encouraging the congregation to match this over the next two weeks. Yeah, just a, a little stirring up, a little encouraging. About four years ago, four summers ago, uh, Alonzo Ramirez um, is the John Knox of Peru. Uh, I've had the privilege of being down there a number of times to preach and to teach in the seminary in Cajamarca up in the Andes, uh, down in Trujillo. Uh, our church has sent teams there to work. We've built, helped them build three new buildings now over the last four years. Alonzo has the Thomas Chalmers mentality. The, the field of dreams mentality. If you build them, they will come. And so they build these buildings and then they fill them up. And then these young guys that they're, they're training in the seminary, and most of them are men who are pastoring Pentecostal churches but are tired of the hype and just want to know what the Bible says, and they're, they're coming out of Pentecostalism and all sorts of uh, Romanism and coming into the Reformed ministry and taking these churches all over the mountainsides there. So Alonzo sent me a note and said, Brother, I need you to pray for me. Uh, my, my, uh, my horse, as he called it, you know, those mountains. He has a Toyota uh, Hilux, and he, he runs the wheels off of that thing. Well, but someone broke it in and stole the computer system out of it. He was, he was about to put tires on it. Tires are expensive. Particularly the kind he needs for running those mountains. Scares me to death. I don't know which is worse. Eyes open, eyes closed. I'm scared, period. It just... But anyway... Our deacons said, okay, how much is it going to cost? Well, the computer system for this, this thing was like $5,000. The tires were 4000 The deacon said, okay, we've got, we've got, you know, here we are, June. We're going we're gonna to throw 2000 at it. We know there are other people who want, other churches that will want to contribute. And we just published it. One of the deacons came up during the announcements and made the announcements. Y'all know Alonzo, Pastor Ramirez, he's been here. Here's what's happened in the past month. He has 3,000. He was almost ready to buy the tires, but now this has happened. Deacons are giving 2,000 out of the deacons fund. We want to raise the rest of it. I'm personally going to tell you, 
I thought our folks would probably give a couple of thousand dollars and we'd cover the tires out of the deacon's fund that was already there and the new giving. $6,000 on two Sunday nights. We designate the evening offering as the diaconal offering. And in two Sunday nights, $6,000 were put in there. We paid for the computer system and the tires. I had a professor he was the founder of Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. He was a group of Southern Baptist men out of a, I'll leave unnamed, Southern Baptist seminary at the time in the 1970s, concerned about the liberalism of the Southern Baptist Convention and the seminaries. And they went out and started another Southern Baptist seminary. Uh, and Dr. Gray would often say in telling the story of Mid-America's founding and funding, and then throughout the years, he'd say, brothers, people ask me, how did you do it, Gray? And he says, it's really simple. We prayed to our God and we told the people. We prayed to our God and we told the people. And that's become the MO of our deacons. We pray to our God and we tell the people. Back to what I said, you know, letting the people know, keeping them in the loop is so important. Uh, our deacons post, you know, their minutes every month out on the deacon bulletin board. So anybody can walk by and see what they did this month and what they talked about and what their, what's on their to-do list and what's on their needs list. And then our deacons are good about, hey, oh brother, now I want to give you a little... Heads up. I'm going to jump ahead to the delegation real quickly. Some people can ask David to do something and it'll make him want to. It'll make him not want to do it. Anybody know anybody like that? There are some people that you just see coming towards you and you know this is, I don't want to hear what he's got to say. Some people have that much tact. There's no space between my fingers, my thumb and my finger. That much. And then others could talk you into going to hell and back for the cause of Christ. That gets into not only delegating out into the congregation, but delegating among yourselves. Some of you are going to be stronger in one area than another area. So don't have Bob doing what David's best at. Have Bob doing what Bob's best at doing. And the same in the congregation. Fiscal, that's enough on that. You all know, stirring up, showing that we're supposed to be generous and cheerful and know this too, that the physical thing, and I've just, kind of, I've, I've just segued into this, the physical thing has a mission element to it. Thomas Chalmers once said, of all the, of all the diaconal work they did in the community, it was always and forever to the end of bringing people to know Christ and to worship the triune God. In other words, it was, as we say these days, missional. I don't even know what that means. It was, it was, it was toward the end of evangelizing, discipling, gathering. It was toward building up the church, which is toward the ultimate end of glorifying God and enjoying him. So everything we do needs to be toward that end. Whether it's paying our pastors, whether it's funding the upkeep of the building, 
Brothers, I'll tell you, we, we, we know who the temple is. The temple is the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that that earthly tabernacle and that earthly temple foreshadowed, pictured, pointing us to the presence of God, God with us, Emmanuel. But God's a God of beauty. And we need to spend money on our buildings sometimes. I want to illustrate this. When I, when I went to Birmingham, Alabama from Westminster, which humanly speaking was one of the worst mistakes I've ever made in my life. God blessed those three and a half years greatly. But I could tell you why it was some of the, one of the dumbest things I ever did. But I gave them a whole list of why I don't think I should be your pastor and what I would expect you to do immediately upon me arriving. And I thought that would be the end of it. Uh, apparently the bluff was not strong enough. And, uh, but one of them was this. I said, fellas, we have, we have to, as my daughter Sophie would say, we have to prettify this building. There was a gutter hanging, twisted off where a limb of a tree had fallen on it sometime in the past and it was still just hanging there. There was a car that they had given a member of the church a, a better car and that old car that they couldn't drive anymore was just sitting out there with a flat tire. Uh, I could go on. That's enough. Oh, there were columns on the front. One of the columns had rotted off at the bottom, you know, from rain and all, and was just hanging there. So we go into this prettify mode to spend the money, stir up the people to, generos gener to be generous and cheerful in their giving, and we prettified the place. We paved the parking lot that was just an old gravel place, and we, we painted the front doors a beautiful red color, and we put a new column or two up there. I cannot tell you how many times you'd think, well, okay, that's nice. Yeah, we should be good stewards and keep the building up. We had new members because of that. The postman came in one day. I'd never met him. He would drop and go, you know, just fast and furious. He stopped in his busy schedule one day and came in. He said, I want to meet who's responsible for this. This. I said, what do you mean? He said, you know, there were, there were about two years when I would drop off the mail here, and I didn't think anybody, I didn't think anybody inhabited this. I thought someone just came and got the mail and took it somewhere else. That's how bad it was. And he said, I live in this neighborhood, thank you. I said, well, you know, praise God. We had a lady down the street who professed to be an agnostic, who came in one day and thanked us for helping the value of her property. I gave her a track and talked to her about the Lord. See, guys, that's good stewardship. And God is a God of beauty. Our buildings need to reflect that. No, they don't need to look like St. Paul's Cathedral. It doesn't need to be, have to be ostentatious. It can be as a, as a dear old OP ruling elder friend of mine, Mr. Charles Toller, he was for many years a ruling elder with Bob Letham up in Wilmington. Mr. Toller would say, you know what I like about you? What is it? You're simple yet elegant. I didn't know what that meant about me, but that's, that's what I mean. It can be simple but elegant. Okay, so the... So the deacon's use of monies is toward the ends of missions, it's toward the end of worship, it's toward the ends of evangelism. We're to be property managers. I'm going to be very succinct on that and just say that. You know that. We're in charge of everything as deacons. And it's all to contribute to the worship, the instruction, the communion of the saints. Uh, so there's a spiritual end to everything we do 
financially and physically uh, and, and the way we use our properties. Thornwell said this, it's certain that the reason assigned by the apostles for ordering their deacon's election applies just as strongly to the collection and disbursements of funds for one person's for one person, purpose as for another. Their purpose, now listen to this, in Acts 6, the apostles' purpose was not to get rid of attending to the poor, but to get rid of secular distractions. Now don't take secular in a, in a bad sense there. What Thornwell's saying, he goes on, it's not reason, said they, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and ministry of the word. What would they have gained by divesting themselves of the care of the poor and continuing to be perplexed with the collection of funds for all other purposes? You see what Thorne will say? Don't be too narrow on this. Don't be fundamentalistic. You know, inference. Good and necessary consequence. Apply the passage. It must be perfectly obvious to every candid mind that the entire secular business of the church was entrusted to the deacons. And that would include, of course, properties as the church came to have properties, to need properties, and to use properties. So let's not disparage that Let's understand the spiritual significance of it. Third, duty to the poor and the needy. I think that's where most people focus, is the obvious in Acts 6. Caring for the poor and the needy. And yet that's the hardest part of it. Again, just deacons this time. Wouldn't you say the wisdom... And the execution of care for poor and needy is the hardest thing we do. It, I mean, just, it's hands down. The money part, you know, unless there's just no money, that's, that's pretty easy, but you need to pray about it. Good stewards wise you know you got to be around the people among the people uh, to help stimulate the people to give more to the needs but this poor and needy thing care for the poor but it's obvious that that's right at the heart of so much of the bible in his relation to the poor we see the deacon expressing the compassion of Christ and uniting the church in suffering. John Gerardo said, the deacon is the office that harmonizes the rich and the poor. That's a great line. The deacon harmonizes the rich and the poor. Now he's not talking about, you know, socialism. He's talking about stimulating those who have to help those who may need at a given time. Paul reminds us that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. We're to be about comforting, and deacons are right there at the, at the point. They're at the epicenter, if you will, of comforting. To do that, we have to join in the suffering. We have to know we're one body in Christ. The rich are instructed in God's word not to be conceited, but to be generous and ready to share. That's 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18. And we're to do as God richly supplies us, Paul said. When one member of the body of Christ suffers, we have the opportunity to better know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. And so we're united to one another as we're brought more closely to experience Christ. Our Lord gave us clear teaching on this when he said, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it, food for the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothes to the naked, visiting the sick and the imprisoned, 
as much as to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine. Robert Webb was a prominent early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century Presbyterian. And he wrote a little book. Uh, it was a series of lectures he delivered at Bellhaven College back in 1915. And in there... He talks about, he compares all the various, various approaches to ministering, caring for poor. All the various approaches to phil, uh, uh, philanthropy, if you will. Utopianism, their view, socialism's view, Marxism's view. He goes through the whole litany, shows how they try to do it, why they do it, and why it's not sufficient in the end and it's not for the proper motives it doesn't glorify God and enjoy him da 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 and then he comes to the Christian and then in there he says our first obligation is to the brotherhood that's what Jesus said here as long as you as you've done it to one of these brothers of mine even the least of them you did it to me so we're a representative body of men drawn from the Christian church to unite the entire body of Christ in the suffering of the poor and the needy. Now, it's hard for me to envision this, but it has been said to me. Our church struggles. We don't have any poor people. As I said, that's hard for me to even, I can't get my brain around that one. I don't know about you and your churches. Uh, we have PhDs and no, no degrees. We have people who live hand to mouth and people who are rather affluent. Uh, it's really pretty. It's, it's kind of like heaven. And uh, so I, I can't, but there are churches, and you all know them. Uh, there are some churches that are just, and they're known in the public as that's a real affluent church. Jesus said, for you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. You know the context. He's not saying don't do for the poor. He was just simply saying, Hey, look, we have priority right now. But the poor will always be with us. The Old Testament taught that. The New Testament's replete with that teaching. You'll always have the poor. That's, that's going to characterize not just the world, but it's going to characterize the church. And it's for good reason. It's for good reason. Just think about it. If everyone were affluent, if everyone were financially able why give why do but God designed it so we would James Ramsey said if but it may be asked of what use are deacons to take care of the poor in churches where there are no poor or but two or three and he says this, that indeed is a sadly defective state of the church where there are no poor. There must be something very deficient in its zeal and aggressiveness. If amidst the multitudes of poor around us and mingling with us, there's none in the church itself. In other words, he says, if there's no poor in your church, you're not doing the main thing, and that is telling them about Jesus. If you're not out there being aggressive in evangelizing, Gerardo said, a church in which there are no poor would do well to raise the question whether it does not lie outside the pale of God's election. For hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Christ's poor relations will ever be found where Christian organizations exist, and the nominal church which he neglects to provide for them confesses itself apostate. Let me summarize that. A church that doesn't have poor or fails to care for the poor is an apostate church. 
according to Jericho. I think that would meet with the New Testament teaching as well. So, we're to take care of the poor. And I'm going to have to be brief on this, written on this. It's published in one of those articles that he referenced. Uh, I think we have an obligation, and this, this does not deny the spirituality of the church, the spiritual nature of the church. We have a responsibility not only to do good to the household of faith, but to all men. Priority goes to those in the church. We don't give to those out there at the neglect of our people. But as we are able, it becomes a wonderful means of reaching people. We're show when they say, why did you do this? And we say what Paul said to the Corinthians, the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ compels us. And by the way, we ought never do for anyone out there or in here in the brotherhood or the neighborhood without telling them why we're doing it. The United Way does good stuff. The mosque does good stuff. The federal government from time to time does good stuff. And they have their reasons for doing it. But we do it because the love of Christ constrains us to do it. And we have a redemptive purpose in it. As I said yesterday, body and soul. Christ came to save body and soul, not just the soul. So when we do for the neighborhood, those outside the brotherhood, those outside the church membership, we're doing it for the glory of God and for the good of people's souls and bodies. It's a redemptive work that we're doing. So don't look at it just as philanthropy. Don't look at it just as, well, we're doing some mercy. Mercy is about redemption. And then delegation. I'll be done with this one, and I'll be short. Uh, I've already touched on it yesterday. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, and I'm here using the New American Standard just because I think it really does more clearly communicate what's intended here. Whom we may put in charge of this task or over this task. Brothers, this is an onerous work. It's a good work. But it's, a, as Pastor said yesterday, or last night, it's a hard work. And it's often messy work. And if you try to do it all, you'll soon do nothing. What happens when you look at something? I've seen this in my children as they've grown up. I'll, give them, I'll tell them what something needs to be done. And I get back and it's not been done. And sometimes you know why? It's because... It was overwhelming. It, 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 it crippled them to think, I can't get that whole yard cut today. Okay, then cut part of it today. We can't, we can't reach everybody in this community. Okay, reach this street. Start with this street. We can't help every poor person in our, in our neighborhood. Okay, Help the first one you come to. Okay, we can't do this on our own. Okay, then ask for help. You know what our deacons have found? Now, if they ask certain people to help them with a certain chore, they're going to they're going to be turned down because they're just not able to do. So here's where coming it comes in handy to know the congregation. Visit your people. Find out who knows what and who does what. Who's interested in what. 
And then you delegate. You call them in to do those things they love doing, that they're good at doing, that they're able to do, that they're willing to do. Because if you try to do it on your own, it'll be just like your son you send out to mow five acres. He realizes he can't do it all before he goes to play ball this afternoon, so he just doesn't do any of it. And that's what the deacons will end up doing in your churches. So delegate it. And then take it on little by little, little bites. The summary. Gerardo says, as donations are spontaneously made, legacies left to the church, he is the receiver. As money is to be raised for various purposes, he is the collector. As funds and property are to be kept administered and administered, he's the treasurer and manager. And his relief is to be extended to the poor, the stipends, paid church officers and agents, he's the distributor. In other words, it's not a small office. So stir up the saints to love and good works to join in with you. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And all the more, that's going to that's gonna draw people to Christ. We're supposed to be a, a sweet aroma. We're just helping the congregation to be a sweet aroma as we do these things. It's time to break. Let me pray as Tim walks down here. Lord, thank you for this brief time and ask that you'd use this for your good and the glory of your, of your glorious church, your bride. Amen.